You have standards and we're going to get there, you know, that's, that's, that's what our mission is, is to get there, to, to eventually be able to say to conventional growers, you don't need to use a mill. you know. The day that we can say that, we'll, we'll be celebrating. So what are you doing? Are you using copper or what are you doing? Um, well, <clears throat> we're using a, a rotation. I mean, I'm, I'm using a weekly rotation of Serenade, uh, Regalia, um, we have used a little bit of copper. I'm not very, very much uh, a big fan of copper. Yeah. I never have been conventionally. Conventionally, I didn't use copper, period, rarely. Um, but we are using a rotation of Serenade, Regalia. Um, there's another product that's been introduced to me this year, Double Nickel. Um, we've been using that product. Is that a biological? Yes. Yeah, what is Double Nickel? Mm. It's a biological and it works like regalia, not so much to kill the fungi, but to keep the plant's resistance up high. So the yeah. regalia is from Japanese knotweed? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. Um, yep. Raising yeah. the plant's phenol levels, is that yep. correct? Yeah, um, raises them. So double nickel, I've not had enough time to do much anything else other than add it to the rotation mm -hmm. because we've been very busy. Um, but we're using, we're using that system uh, along with our compost tea. But it's been really tricky this year. Um, for instance, on a day where you're brewing compost tea to spray, uh, we're trying to keep the, the UV rays off of our tea. Um, and so we're, doing, we're making that application in the evening around seven o'clock or so. It's about a four hour or five hour process. Prior to that, during the day, I'll come through and uh, kind of wipe the slate, so to speak, with Oxidate. Um, and try to to burn any lesions of late blight that I can can come across, and that's really been the only major issue that we've had. We've not had any major insect issues. We have a pretty good balance, uh, even with all the rain. Uh, we've not had any major issues with early blight or any speck or significant infection. It's the late blight that is really uh, kind of really hurting us. It was pretty amazing, actually. I'd say for how good those tomatoes looked on an organic regime and the amount of rain we had until the late bike finally got to us. We knew it was coming, you know, I mean, we had plenty of warning. There just wasn't much we could do about it. But the other, the other diseases that you would expect in all that rain, our spray routine was totally taking care of them, you know. Right, we, we've yeah. been expecting the late blight thing for probably for two weeks or so. Pat and I were just each day, hey, any time now, hey, any time now. Well, I mean, I'm, we're looking every day and, and not seeing it. Um, and knowing it's in the area, so we, we were not shocked that we that we had it um, had it show up, especially with all the rainfall. But a typical week would be um, your 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 biologicals or your fungicides on a Monday. Give them a couple of days. Hopefully, you don't have too much rain. Maybe you're brewing tea Wednesday and applying Thursday. So you, you may spray your fungicides Monday, you may go with Oxidate Thursday morning, compost tea Thursday evening, and then you're right back in it. You know, and, and it may be sooner than that, you may be back with your biologicals on Saturday. Um, it, it's just been a really tough year um, for, for outside production. And inside, you can just about time it. I mean, you obviously we don't have any rainfall, so. These are actually were taken from suckers. We've really figured out that that's an easy way to make sure we get a, a late crop is just take some suckers, they root in 10 days or so, put them out. And of course they're looking way better because they're not loaded with fruit so they can put more of their energy into defending themselves. They get the same spray routine, we have high hopes. You know, very often what happens at late blight in this area is we get the manure kicked out of us really bad and then it gets hot in August and the late blight goes away. And if you can keep the tomatoes alive, you can get a second wind. And so that's what we're hoping for. And that's why our strategy is to always try and put some late tomatoes out. 
you know, the hope to get a second wind when the late blight is not as virulent, when the conditions don't set it up. Okay, so we're going to head over to the compost facility. Um, this is the bed, by the way, that I talked about that Jeremy, Jeremy worked so hard on. I put a little bit of time in, but it was almost all him. And, and Tim, Tim's not with us right now, and basically he's just scuffle hoed this. Now he can't do it because it's too wet, but simply scuffle hoed it. He's not going to do anything else with it, but come back in and put several layers of organic materials, lasagna bed technique, and we'll plant our fall brassicas right through it. Um, take advantage of the fact that the soil is dry for a little bit to get rid of the weeds, come back and plant. And then later in the season, we'll pull off the lasagna bed layer till it's down to where there's something that cover crop can grow in. We'll under, under sow cover crop under, crop under the brassicas, and it'll just go till next spring, when hopefully by then we'll have a roll for our little walk-behind tractor. We'll roll down the mature cover crop. We use a bruisey rye because it comes in 30 days early and gives us uh, uh, the most biomass tends to come from rye. Bruzy doesn't go dormant, so it really puts a lot of growth on in the, in the winter. We'll use a bruisey rye and probably Austrian winter peas, crimson clover. They're all easy to kill early. Kill them off by rolling them and then plant right through that. So we're just continually trying to figure out how not to turn the soil at all. Okay, um, as we come across here, I want to show you one plant as we head to the compost tea facility and the um, composting facility. This side of the garden normally is completely planted this year. It was so wet we couldn't really plant it. Um, and this plant, eventually you'll probably want to come close up to see what I'm talking about. I learned this plant from um, Virginia Tech. This is a cup plant and it's we have several more we're going to put around on the edges. It's too big, we've learned, to really have in the garden. But what's special about this plant, I mean, you can see it right now. When it's in flower, it is just utterly a buzz, you know. And that's when I teach beneficial insect classes, I said, look, I say, look for the plants that are a buzz. And this one is a spectacular example of that. What's it called again? Cup plant. Cup? Cup plant. And the reason it's called a cup plant, Janine, is that the way the, the leaf hits the stem, uh -huh. it guides the dew and the rain to a little cup at the, at the stem. Okay. So then it is our water feature for our tiny insects. Mm. Even on a dry day, there's water at the base of every stem. And when you're trying to have the diverse habitat you need for beneficial insects to really control, to be in balance, you want to have a water feature. You know, it'd be ideal to have a nice little fountain. That'd be even better. But we don't have that. We have the cup plant. You can have that anywhere, you know. Um, and so the longer I grow this, the happier I am with it. It just, it, it has so many functions. And then in the end, it makes great stalks for the compost pile. And stalks are gold for compost. You got to have those stalks, you know. So it's a, a favorite, a favorite of ours. Though we've all decided it needs to go to the edge of the garden, not in it, you know. So we'll change that. Let's head to the compost facility. Where we see color crops is where our garlic came out. We grow um, German white, our variously named either New York Extra Hardy or German Hardy. Um, we regularly get heads that are about three inches. 